My name is Meredith Dalt and I'm a business journalist at Smith School of Business. I'm in town from Kingston. It's lovely to be here. Um, today, we're, I'm going to be your moderator for our chat, Marketing Evolution, a fireside chat with Ken Wong. Regretfully, we do not have a fireplace. We are hoping that those of you in the room can provide the warmth that a fireplace would otherwise provide. So thank you to the also to the um, 14 or so hundred people uh, watching at home today. A couple of housekeeping things. This hour long discussion will be recorded. All of you will get a virtual recording just for being here. All of you at home will also get a virtual recording just for having enrolled. Um, and we're gonna be taking questions in the second half of the presentation. So for those of you who are in person, a mic, a live mic will be being passed around. For those of you who are at home, Please put your questions in the Q&A box. Do not use the chat. The chat function will be open. I want you to use the Q&A button for your questions and I will be receiving your questions on my little device and we will hopefully make this work. All right, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor, Ken Wong. Ken is an associate professor of marketing at Smith School of Business where he is among the most popular faculty members. I think all of you here today will uh, vouch for that. He is also an alumnus holding both a Bachelor of Commerce and an MBA from Queens, now Smith. Among his many accomplishments, Ken was the principal architect of the first full-time MBA program in Canada to operate completely outside of government subsidy, an MBA focused on science and technology. That accomplishment led to Ken becoming a bit of a cover model with Canadian Business Magazine. Ken has taught in degree programs across North America. He also sits on several advisory boards and boards of directors. He's a member of the Canadian Marketing Hall of Legends. He also holds the Financial Post's Leaders in Management Education Award, a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in undergraduate, MBA, and executive development programs. Ken is a frequent media commentator, addressing the global audiences, uh, addressing global audiences on everything from business strategy and branding to pricing and retail practice. And today he's with us to chat about marketing evolution as we look back on his remarkable 40 plus year career. Welcome, yeah. Ken. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, by the way, and those online as well. Okay, well, it's just such a, such a great thing to have so many people we have. For those of you at home, we have about 100 people in the audience and a lot more at home. So, so I want to start by situating us in the present moment, which is indeed an interesting and changing one. Um, Ken and I did a webinar in 2021, and, and that was at the end of 2021, and we talked about some of the issues of the day, including COVID, those kinds of things. But my God, I was thinking about it, how much things have changed even since 2021. So where we are now, significant inflation, supply chain shortages, a war in Europe, a potential banking crisis in the US, COVID continues to be a thing. Um, how are all of this, this confluence of factors changing the world of marketing today? Hmm. <laughs> Nothing like starting with an easy one, huh? Right? <laughs> um, well, let me start off with a little bit of a maybe facetious answer while I dream up what I'm going to say next. Okay. Uh, you know, as you were rhyming off these situations, I was thinking, well, geez, you know, I, I, like a lot of other public speakers, I, I have a talk on marketing in times of inflation, marketing in times of COVID, marketing after COVID and so on. So uh, I, I'm thankful for all these opportunities to contribute to my mortgage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, I think the big change is, is that it's really made marketers focus a lot more on margin over volume. Okay. And, and the reason for that really has to do with, uh, with what we've discovered in, in, uh, in, in trying to market under all of these conditions. You know, as a strategist, now creative is, uh, is very different, but as a strategist, your starting point is always, what is the consumer state today? And what would they do in the absence of any intervention from me as a marketer? Because when you strip away all the niceties, marketing is really the task of getting somebody to do something they wouldn't otherwise do without that intervention. And so you really have to start with, what is the starting point of the consumer's behavior? And with COVID, we discovered something that was very different than every other situation. Usually demographics have always been a great guidepost to what the consumer wanted. You know, we all know about Gen Z and Gen X and, and so on. But demographics didn't tell the story in COVID. You know, what told the story were things like, where does your income, where's your income source? 
you know, if you came from an industry like PPE, which shot out of the blocks, uh, but you knew that that wasn't going to go on forever, sooner or later it was going to come down. How you reacted to COVID was very different than if you were in an industry like uh, telemedicine, which took off and is staying hot to this day, or areas like uh, airline travel, which took a, a dive, obviously, and, and now is back in resurgence. And so suddenly those demographics that we used to use to buy media and plan campaigns, they weren't quite as informative. Um, you know, David Foote, the demographer, used to say that demographics is 95% of human behavior. I spoke to David a few years ago and he said, well, it's probably more down around 55% today. Okay. And the reason is that we started to see that non-demographic factors in especially attitudes and opinions were a big, a, big, a, a, a big factor in categorizing how people would behave. So if you think about COVID, it mattered whether you were a vaxxer or an anti-vaxxer. It mattered whether you believed in wearing masks or didn't believe in masks. You might expect that people who were pro-vaxxers would also wear masks. Donald Trump proved that opposite, right? Um, and, and so in all these cases, all of a sudden, those demographic indicators weren't there. And that made it much harder for us to size markets because now you're trying to probe people's attitudes, their interests, their opinions. Um, and, and, and so what we saw was markets started to fragment. And when you started to couple these things, so now it wasn't just your reaction to inflation, it was your reaction to inflation, depending upon how you had reacted to COVID and so on and so forth. So the cumulative effect made this market fragmentation even more. And so now we are a very, a, a very divisive society. You really can't find that average consumer anymore. Uh, we've been driven to, to more and more personalization. And because it's tied to attitudes and opinions, uh, markets have gotten smaller and more complex to communicate with. So the cost of marketing has gone up. You have to also add to that that much of our attitudes are formed by our information sources. And what we've seen is a politicization of those information sources. So if you're in the States, for example, and you're on the right wing side of things, you probably watch Fox News. If you're more on the left wing side of things, you probably watch CNN. And so all of a sudden, the world was operating with two different realities, two different sets of information. And you know, if you were a Fox uh, advocate, and you heard something on from CNN, you were very skeptical uh, of, of its accuracy. We've all know about fake news and, and so on. So now you've got a more complex marketing message being delivered to a public that is more skeptical. And that means the cost of marketing starts to go up. Now here comes inflation. <laughs> and all of I'm a already sudden, so in this hole of like, where do, how do we get out? Like, yeah, now add inflation, add okay, inflation, go. Right? So <laughs> costs go up, your prices need to go up. But under inflation, everybody wants your prices to stay down. Yeah. So margins start to get compressed. And all of a sudden, everybody starts looking for more efficient ways to do marketing. And so, you know, instead of doing surveys now, we're, uh, you know, with, with telephones, we're, we're doing them online. Now we're using analytics, existing data in place of a lot of that, that, that survey research. Um, you know, we're replacing customer service with chatbots, for example. Uh, artificial intelligence starts to become important to try and copyright and do things as inexpensively as possible. And, and so that really creates a dilemma for managers now trying to decide where do I put my money? You're going to avoid giving us an answer here, aren't you? You're just going to keep try. telling us it's really hard. It's, what the marketers in the room are like, but what should we do, Ken? Well, I'll give you the classic academic <laughs> answer. It, it depends. <laughs> no, it, it, it does, but it does depend. It depends who you're selling to. Right. And it depends what you're selling. Okay. So we're already in this tough marketing place. Now, what do we do about all the consumer anger? Because the inflation thing, as you know, nobody wants to pay $2 for a can of chickpeas these days. Yeah, you're right. You know. and, and you only have to look at the recent experience that the grocers had talking to the Senate uh, yeah. to realize it. Um, and, and with all due respect to, to those executives, and I, and I think they, they gave an accurate depiction of the situation, but it, it's not a message the consumer really wants to hear. Right. The consumer doesn't want an education about why inflation is happening. 
when they hear that education, it comes across as an excuse. Remember, they're more skeptical, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and so they're looking at things and they're going, geez, you know, uh, you're talking about the fact that you're not making more money, but look at your financials and how much more money you're making and, and so on. So, so they don't believe it. What consumers want is action. They want to see demonstrations that you're actually doing something to lessen the severity of the blow. So when Loblaws said, all right, on our existing inventory of no-name products, we're not going to raise prices. Right? Normally, we would do what, what in accounting that they call a, a, a LIFO, a last in, first in. And so we price things based on the replacement price we expect to pay for those supplies. They said, well, no, we're going to do a FIFO. Whatever came in first, we'll add our margin to that, and that's what we'll sell it for. We'll worry about the rest down the line. Very honorable thing to do not something you can continue doing forever. Right. And so now they're accused of, well, you know, it was all a big stage show. Uh, there was no sincerity behind it and so on. Right. What they should be doing is taking, is demonstrating the actions they're taking to fight inflation. You know, they should be donating stale merchandise to food banks, for example, instead of trying to sell it at a discount price. Um, they should be talking about the things that they're doing to keep costs down. And I'll give you a, a, a stark piece of comparison. We are furious about grocery store prices. Yesterday, Dollarama announced their, uh, their fourth quarter earnings up 260 odd million dollars. Uh, expansion plans that'll take them from 2,100 stores to 3,000 within three years. Phenomenal success. Mm -hmm. They interviewed consumers coming out of dollar stores, all of them celebrating Dollarama. It's not that they were making money. It's just that Dollarama, they got the sense, you're on our side. You're with us in this battle. Mm -hmm. You're keeping prices down. And, and the fact that they've been able to do that, despite, it's not really Dollarama anymore. It's $5 Dollarama, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. You know, really says something about the consumer's mindset. The consumer wants action. They don't want explanations. They don't want an education. They want to see that you're doing something purposive. Except that Dollarama is guilty of shrinkflation, like crazy shrinkflation. They're selling little tiny portions for a dollar fifty, when in fact, you know, volume-wise, you'd do better somewhere else. Well, so, so Dollarama works differently than than your conventional merchant, though. Your conventional merchant works cost plus. Here's what it costs us. Now we add our margin. This is the final price. Dollarama works really from price. They start to they say, what is the price somebody's willing to pay for this product? And then what do we have to do to be able to deliver a product at that price with this margin? So one is cost-based pricing. The other is price-based costing. Mm -hmm. And Dollarama does price-based costing exceptionally well. Right. Okay. Now, what do the rest of the brands do who've got angry customers who don't have that kind of flexibility? They better decide which, which uh, game they want to play. Okay. Do they want to be a low-end merchant? And if so... They have to really focus on containing costs. And that means trying to figure out what's a good cost, what's a bad cost. What are the costs we incur that the consumer insists upon? And which costs are more arbitrary and discretionary? So again, if you come back to the Dollarama example, you've got um, mostly low rent locations, not a lot of store fixtures. Um, a lot of their growth is coming groceries, but not perishables, nothing requiring refrigeration or freezers. The products are shelf stable and simple. You don't go to a Dollarama and say, tell me a little bit about this product. You know, <laughs> we all know what the products are. Um, and so probably the, you know, the most frequent question you ask a staff member at Dollarama is what aisle is this in? And, and that might even be intentional to make you walk the store, right? who, who knows? Um, but when you don't have wages, that's a big chunk of cost of, of retailing. When you know that you're going to sell a specific inventory and you're buying that to, to a certain price point, that simplifies the whole process. And so Dollarama is really built to compete on low price. Now, you take a store like um, the Bay has just opened Zellers, right? And Zellers is a historic brand here in Canada. But Zellers is not equipped to compete against Dollarama. Right. And, and so they're, they're going to have some real difficulty. I think once you try and service two different customers with one product, you end up giving somebody something that they don't need. And that raises your costs and 
makes you uh, less competitive. So do you anticipate, given where we are in the world, we talked about at the beginning, all these things happening. Does that mean we're really going into this world where things are either Dollarama or they're really upscale? I mean, we talk of, we know that, you know, populations are splitting that way too along economic lines. Yeah, certainly, uh, we're certainly seeing more evidence of that. We're, we're seeing an exodus. But that doesn't mean that there's, that there is a, a lack of business opportunity at the upper end. It's just more concentrated. I mean, we've all seen the stats that, that a huge percentage of the nation's wealth is concentrated in the hands of a small number of people. Mm. If that's the case and you're going to go high end, you, know, you don't want to sell to everybody in Kingston, Ontario, for example. You know, there might be five or six people uh, that you want to sell to in Kingston who can afford Nordstrom and, and, and the like. Um, so you really have to have discipline uh, to know who you're selling to. And, and, and how they want to be served. Which segues nicely into this question because you've been at this for so long, 40 plus years. We're not using the term retirement today. We <laughs> are definitely thinking about 40 years. And over that time, of course, there've been so many generational changes. Um, we've talked about, uh, you know, we've had boomers and Gen X and millennials and all of those groups. And over the years, you've talked about how they've all had different needs. Um, what kind of changes have brands had to sort of realize to, to, keep, to keep up with all these changing demographics? Well, again, uh, you know, when we talk about Gen Xers and millennials or baby boomers, as the case may be, we're really talking about a, a mythical average consumer, <laughs> right? right? I, I mean, I, I am a boomer, uh, but I'm not like every other boomer. Right. right? Again, the, the demographics just aren't killing. And maybe the best example of that is, um, uh, I read an article once that talked about becoming an adult. Right? And they said there are five things that you do in becoming an adult. You graduate from school, you get a job, uh, you probably uh, meet someone, uh, settle down, um, and then the last two, you might either have kids and then buy a house, or you buy a house and, and then you have kids. In my generation, you completed those five stages by your late 20s, early 30s. Nowadays, the journey may never get complete. <laughs> I mean, in fact, nowadays you graduate, whether you get a job or not, you're probably moving back home with your parents until you can afford, uh, afford your own place. It, it, it's very, very different. And, and so marketers have had to become much more personal. It, it really is becoming a game of markets of one. It's not enough now to service a segment anymore. You really have to get down to the, to the nitty gritty. Take a university as uh, uh, your classic example. You know, uh, we assume that everybody comes for knowledge, and, and if you believe that, you know, I probably have a bridge I'd like to sell you. Um, <laughs> you know, because the reality is, some people come to university because they think it's a prerequisite to getting a job. Mm -hmm. Other people come to university because they want to live up to their parents' expectations. Um, there's a myriad of reasons why. And there's a myriad of different experiences. So for example, if you come to a professional school, you're probably getting something career oriented. You're probably in smaller classes. You're working closely in groups. You're forming a very strong bond with, with all of your fellow students. By contrast, if you do a classical liberal arts degree, now you're taking Slate 100 in an arena with you know, 400 other students. It's a very different experience. So when a marketer used to look at, are you university educated or not? It told us a lot about your behavior and, and the baggage you were bringing into the purchase world. Nowadays, it doesn't do that anymore. And so we really do have to get down to this notion of markets of one. But what does that mean actually? Like how does a marketing, how does a marketing agency or team figure out who that market of one is? How do they do that? That's where all the new technology comes Aha, out. next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because, you know, you, you think about it, you know, the questions we want to answer haven't changed in, in, in decades. They haven't changed since I was a student and long before that. You know, what do people want? What, what, what are they looking for? What problem are they trying to solve with this problem? We didn't have the technology before to answer those questions well. And so what do we do? Well, we, we ran surveys, right? And the underlying assumption is that, you know, uh, the opinions you express in a survey are a good reflection of the behavior. Well, we know that's not true. I mean, people lie on surveys, right? <laughs> right. You know, a survey says, you know, uh, 
would you rather pay $2 or $1.95? Well, let me think about that. That's a tough question, isn't it? Um, we'd ask questions about you know, social desirability and people would give us the socially acceptable answer, not how they, how they really felt. We didn't have any other way of gauging it. Now we have analytics. We have data sets from loyalty programs and the like, all of which tell us what your past behavior has been. Right. And if you make the assumption that nothing predicts your future behavior as well as your past behavior, suddenly now, I know when I go to the grocery store, I show them my loyalty card. They know what I've bought in the past. The UPC scanner can pick up what I'm buying on that day. And if there was an aggressive enough marketer out there, they could be looking at that UPC scanner data and saying, well, next time somebody passes with this code, give them this coupon from a competing good. The whole world starts to change because now I can get down to you as an individual. And as long as I don't violate your privacy, as long as I don't share that data wildly and, and, and I show some integrity in its use, I can give you a more personal shopping experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine the day where, you know, we talk about shopping bots, right? So imagine a day you sign on to a computer uh, terminal and they ask you a few qualifying questions, right? So this one might be, what products do you normally buy? You indicate them. And then maybe they ask you a second question. Uh, which of these products do you look for acceptable quality at the lowest price? Which of these products do you tend to look for better quality even though it may be higher priced. Okay? And on that basis, it kicks out a shopping list for you. Here's the products we think you should buy. And by the way, based on today's featured prices, according to the flyers and so on, um, here's where you could buy them for, for the cheapest price. And so your entire shopping basket, if you go to store A, will be this much. If you go to store B, will be that much. That's a highly personal shopping experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, and, and all of a sudden, consumers are are freed from making that hard choice of. Do what, consumers what like shop? being freed from that hard choice? Do we feel like we're losing some <coughs> autonomy? I think consumers want the option of making the choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, remember that that AI, when it kicks out a recommendation, it doesn't mean you have to accept it. It means you know, here's a starting point for your consideration. Right. Um, and in the same way, these devices don't mean you have to shop there, but if you're looking to save some time, it can do so. Right, so in your opinion then, do you think that AI and analytics is the biggest technological change that we've seen in terms of thinking about marketing or? No, no, the biggest change is uh, really lies in the area of communications. Okay. Um, you know, uh, when I grew up uh, in marketing, communication was all one way. Right? You did your research, you found out what people wanted to hear about, and then you wrote ads and offered products accordingly. Now, all of a sudden, the consumer can talk back to us. And so now it's like having a, an automated sales rep. Right. Right? I mean, if you think about it, why would you have a, a sales rep? Well, you have a sales rep because the message can't be standardized. It has to be modified uh, at the point of, uh, of presentation. And you don't know what the consumer is going to object to. So you have to have somebody who's able to answer those questions. And historically, we had to do that with a sales rep. Advertising was one way. It couldn't make those fine last minute accommodations and it couldn't respond to questions in, in advance. Now we have the technology that lets us do that. That technology is what produces the data for analytics. And the data for analytics is what gets used in all of the modeling that goes into artificial intelligence. Okay. So it, it all starts with the, the two-way flow of information and, and the increased data. Got it. I've got this stat from Salesforce I want to share with you. Sure. That 54%, they say, of revenue is expected to come from digital channels by 2024. That's up from 42% in 2022. So more than half of revenues companies are expected to come from digital channels. Are companies ready for that kind of change? I mean, we're, get, we're getting there, but what do you think? Uh, in a word, no, uh, absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, it, it's not hard to understand why either. Uh, you look at COVID, uh, normally uh, digital channels, e-commerce uh, e was growing as a percentage of retail, something like 1% per year. Right? In the first year of COVID, it grew by, I think it was 15 years, 15%. That's 15 years growth 
in one year. Yeah. We didn't have the infrastructure with which to handle it. And, and frankly, we still don't. We're still learning uh, uh, about how to do this and how to do it properly. Um, you know, and, and as a consequence, we really haven't been able to deliver to people all of the promises of e-commerce. And in some cases, in fact, uh, our e-commerce model is failing. And I'll, I'll give you a simple example. If you think about why somebody wouldn't use e-commerce, number one, I want to touch the goods. Mm. I can't touch the goods on, on e-commerce. I want to smell it. I want to taste it, what, what have you. Mm. Number two, um, shipping costs. Um, buy this product is three dollars by the way 1985 for for shipping costs it's right? a deterrent it's a deterrent yes right? uh, we still haven't found a way around that as as hard as we've tried i mean prime with its subscription of course went a long way and a lot of companies are moving in that direction but let's go back to dollarama people don't realize it but a big part of dollarama's success is built on convenience yeah, eighty percent of Canadians live within ten kilometers of a Dollarama store. Wow. So if I have a choice between buying something for a buck on Alibaba or Amazon and paying six dollars in shipping costs, or driving for five minutes to Dollarama, I'm driving for five minutes to Dollarama. Right. And if Dollarama's product doesn't work, I can bring it back and get a return. If it doesn't work on Amazon, good luck. If it doesn't work for IKEA. Right now, I, I mean, I love IKEA, don't get me wrong, but IKEA doesn't have customer service anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no phone number you can call. There's no return you can make anymore. We want to go it's lie down huge, on the bed. Huge deterrent. <laughs> I hope we want to try them out. Yeah, well, we can do that sleep country. We just pay a little more. <laughs> but it is a thing. I mean, we're still human at the end of the day. So can we replace everything with digital? I mean, we still do want to touch the things. Oh, I mean, yeah. I was reading about the rise of live shopping in China. And it's coming here more where you're literally able to buy the dress right off the model. It's almost like the return to um, the shopping channel. You know, yeah. you buy the thing that she's modeling just right now and I get the dress the next day. Yeah. Shopping is, is, is uh, for some people, a very functional experience, right? Mm -hmm. I know what I want. I want to get in. I want to get it with the product as quickly as possible at the lowest price. Yeah. For other people, shopping is, it's a social activity. You know, you go to a mall. What, what do you see in the food court? whole bunch of seniors <laughs> you know, sitting around uh, talking the, the day's events. Um, but nowadays, again, this demographics doesn't work anymore. Who are the experienced shoppers? Who are the people prepared to pay a little more for the experience of feeling special? It's not the seniors. Right. We're on fixed income. We're all hard pressed. You know, we, we need to save our money. Uh, it, it's actually the younger consumer. Right. They want the theme stores. They want the extended experience. Okay. And, and you can't, you, you know. You I'm, haven't figured I, out how to replicate that. Yeah, I can't smell the goods on TV, I, right. on a computer monitor. I can't feel them. I can't taste them. It defies the senses. So what does this mean then? The it means, future? well, it, if you can't rely on the senses for self-discovery, now your advertising messages have to be able to convey that emotion, convey that sensory experience without you actually experiencing it. Now, go back to what I said earlier, we got a more skeptical consumer out there. It gets very, very difficult. Yeah. And that's why omni-channel is becoming so important in a lot of businesses right now, because I want the convenience uh, uh, of e-commerce, but I also want the flexibility and the experience of going into the store to make that return if I have to, right. or to pick it up and, and so on. Okay. Um, can I'm mindful of the time it's one o'clock. So what we're going to do is we're going to I've got lots more questions for you. But what we're going to do is give the audience a chance to get involved here. So I've got questions coming in virtually. The mic people are going to start circulating with mics. And so if you have a question live audience, um, look for one of the mic people as they start to circulate. I mean, we're going to Oh, there's Amber. And there's Heather. So you guys get ready. Uh, I've got this question from the virtual audience. Ken, what are your thoughts on the marketing of electric vehicles and con convincing consumers to buy one when they are often still more expensive? Well, I think that uh, the, the question is half the answer. Um, <laughs> you know, as long as they're still more expensive, your market's going to be limited to the really ecologically minded consumer, right? Right, because they're really paying for that 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 privilege of living up to to their ethics. 
for people who are more neutral uh, about the environment, um, price will be a major deterrent. But you think about it, what are the other reasons why we don't buy electric? Well, I'm worried that it's not gonna have the range that I require. I worry that I'm gonna be driving down the road and I'm gonna run out of power and I'm not gonna be able to get it you know, uh, recharged and so on. Until that infrastructure is in place, until they improve battery technology to guarantee us those extended ranges, until they improve the onboard monitoring devices that tell us how much power is left and so on. Um, it's crapshoot, it's a risk. Right. And okay. the more risky the innovation, the less likely somebody is to buy it. So even as gas prices climb and climb. And until until the, the economics, the total price, because that's what people will ask, right? right. It's, it's more expensive, but if I save enough on gas, I'm prepared to pay the premium. Well, if you're not prepared to save enough on gas, there's still a premium. Got it. And now the government has to step in and offer uh, some kind of rebate or something else to uh, to make nice it happen. Buyer, Let's see. All right, we've got a question. Here it is. Hi, Ken. My name is Jessica Wilford. I'm a BCom07. Hi, Jessica. I work for a food ingredients company, so we are B two B. And so I'm curious as to your thoughts on how some of what we've talked about today and the evolution of marketing would tie into the B2B space where the people I'm often selling to are procurement officers or food scientists in my case? It's a great question. Um, and I'm happy you raised it because we're often accused in marketing of being all about B2C and not enough about B2B. When I think of B2B, so let me start from a, a earlier starting point. As a marketer, my primary concern is my customer's need. When I'm selling to a business, there's really only one need that matters, and that's their need to make money, right? And the rule of the jungle is very simple. If my customer can't make enough money on their own, they take some of mine, right? They take it in the form of lower prices, they take it in the form of free services that they expect, and so on and so forth. So in any B2B customer, you're trying to think, what can I do to improve my customer's profitability? Well, profitability has a nice, simple definition, doesn't it? Price minus cost, that's your margin, times your volume, which is market share times market size. So the question that I would ask if I'm a B2B company is, what can I do to enhance their price realization? Which is another way of saying, since nobody ever paid more for something they can get elsewhere for less, what can I do to help them differentiate? What can I do to to say to them, let me show you how you can use my ingredient to stand apart from everybody else. It may cost a little more, but look at how much more you're gonna make at that price point. I might also ask myself, what can I do to help reduce my customer's costs? Right? Now, that's not just selling them your product at a lower price. It might do with value-added services that you provide. It might do with locating your distribution points closer to their warehouses to, to minimize shipping costs and the like. There are a lot of direct and indirect ways that we can reduce customers' costs. I look at market share. I, I might do some market research for people and say, you know, the X percent of the market wants this right now. We know how big that opportunity is. Let me show you how you can tap into it. We might even say, let me be your tool uh, of, of differentiation. I will sell to you, but for the first two years, I won't sell this product to anybody else. You will have a monopoly. You will be able to win that part of the market that really wants that because no one else will be able to give it. Or I might play to market size and say, did you realize that there's a whole market out there you're not serving? And why aren't you serving them? Because you don't have this ingredient. Well. I can give you that ingredient. So let me show you how I can truly become your partner in profitability. We can't assume that the customer is going to make those connections on their own. They got a business to run, but they're too busy to figure out why they should buy X versus Y. We need to tell them that story. And so in a, in a sense, we, we're almost going in, in, in a B2B case with a business case for them a profit justification for why they should buy from us, which is very different from, you know, we've got a little more of factor X, so we last a little bit longer, these product features. So we really want to do that translation to profitability for them. 
Thanks, Ken. We've got another question from the virtual audience. Now, I know you have often said that advertising is not marketing. I just want to reiterate that. Ken tells mm -hmm. us that often. This is a question about TV advertising, however. Does the 30 second TV commercial still have a future? Does it matter outside the Super Bowl? Okay, so let me start by saying <laughs> that, that, that the reason I say marketing isn't advertising is, is uh, my former students will remember this, this comment. Um, advertising is the creative side of marketing. I am not a creative guy, right? I mean. Look at my dress, you know, blue suit, white shirt, red tie. Not, not exactly the uniform of creativity. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd expect a couple of tats, maybe a piercing, a little man bun, you know, something of, <laughs> something of that ill. Ken with a man bun. We're all yeah. imagining that right now. Uh, well, you should see my graduation photo from 76. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, so, so I, I st you know, I, 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 I can't say I understand the creative process. I know how to kill it. But I, I don't know how to <laughs> I don't know how to create it. So I, that's why I don't teach advertising. Um, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> Does the thirty second TV commercial still matter? I mean, we all we all know that a lot of people in this room probably don't own a television. So uh, so number one, uh, uh, generational. Um, you look at the younger generation, many of them don't own TVs, right? right? They're, they're streaming everything. And, and so it's a different kind of, of advertising altogether. But even if you think about those who watch TV, um, and now this is a difficult one because uh, this one's based on observation, not research, okay? <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan of the voice. I, I love the voice. Okay? I, I, I just, I love to see people sing and dance and do their thing. And I'm very sensitive this year because it's, if you're a voice fan, you know it's Blake Shelton's last year. So this is my last year. <laughs> lot of, lot of, the audience just learned so much about a lot you. Of, a lot of similarities there. Anyway, so when I watch The Voice, I'm really watching because I want to see these contestants, right? So what do I do? Well, I don't watch The Voice. I tape The Voice, and then I watch You do it. not tape The I Voice. I do indeed. On, and a, I, on and a what? I, a videotape? No, 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 on my PVR. <laughs> oh, come on, I'm not that much of a dinosaur. <laughs> No, on my, on my PVR. And then you know, when I'm watching, what do I do? I skip them, right? right? I, I flick to the performances. And, and so you know, if you're advertising on The Voice, you better be careful because unless you've got something of interest that grab my attention right off the bat and, and, and even placement in that two minute span between segments, you know, if you're at the front end, I might see you and be interested and listen. If you're stuck somewhere around a minute 15, you were a flip on the screen as I, as, I, as I blew by. By contrast, there are other events, well, like the Super Bowl at the other extreme where the ads are part of the entertainment. And in that instance, we, we approach these ads with a very different, different mindset. Right, so do TV ads still matter, especially when half the people watching TV are also looking at another screen while they do it? Well, again, the classic marketer, it, it depends where you're advertising aye, aye. and what you're advertising. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, another live question. Uh, Dan Tish, uh, EMBA 96. Um, Ken, great to see you. Um, uh, more than, I'm trying to think of the date, the date, I don't remember it, but more than 25 years ago, you launched a new disruptive new MBA program. Um, if you were launching one today, and you wanted to disrupt the market, um, how would it look? Uh, how, would, how would it be different? What does business education need today and, and how would we market it? Wow. Uh, so first of all, a little bit of context. Uh, Dan was our PR, uh, our PR account manager uh, when we launched the MBA. And, uh, and thanks to Dan, uh, we were able to, I think in our first year, I think we generated close to 100,000 inquiries for the program with a $10,000 marketing budget which says an awful lot about the power of PR and as we would now think the power of social media uh, and the like, very, very uh, efficient, uh, you know, as opposed to, to advertising. How did you do it? Uh, well, it started, <laughs> <laughs> so it actually started very, very simply. Um, so first of all, when you're developing a, a, a product, and I, in this case, our product was a degree program, you don't control everything just because you're the chair of the program. You know, faculty have independence. 
Um, and so I can turn to somebody and say, I want you to do this. And they can say, jump in the lake. And I have no legal authority to make them do otherwise. It, it's kind of like being a classic brand manager, right? We have bottom line responsibility for the performance of our product, but we can't go and tell R&D to do this or tell production to do that. We really have to curry their favor. So the, the story really starts with convincing our faculty that we didn't have to be mediocre. You know, at, at that time, Western was the undisputed number one business school in Canada. Today, I think Western is an omelet. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, they've been replaced. And I think the, the, the change really came when, when schools started to realize when you come to a professional school, it's not the same as when you come and get a general BA. You're not, I mean, you are looking for an education for life. I don't want to discount that because there is great value in, in the liberal arts, even if you're studying business. But you are there for a career. And, and if you think about an MBA for science and technology, what is your starting point as a consumer? Well, it probably means that you've got a degree in math or engineering or computing science. So you've got the quant side taken up. Um, but you're frustrated because there's a whole new wave of businesses coming out that are being run by people with all of these great technical skills, but they don't know how to manage a company. And so there's a real value add. And so the question we would ask ourselves at every stage was, does this add value to that technical degree? Second thing it did for us is we started to realize a little bit of Six Sigma here. If you've already got a four-year degree in math, do you really need a course in intro stats? Right. Right? You don't. Well, if you don't need a course in intro stats, that suddenly frees up a chunk of time. And now I can take that time and I can give you a course in something that they didn't teach you in science. So is that how you marketed to them? You said, we'll give you a whole MBA without any of that stuff you don't need. No, we'll give you a career. How did you do $10,000 into 100,000? Uh, what did you say the number was? $10,000 turned into 100,000 100, inquiries, inquiries for the program. How did you do that? Just high level. Uh, I think I gave 90 interviews in the first 30 days to okay. the press. Right. Um, so you're still using traditional media marketing in that sense. And, the, uh, and to be fair, uh, while I take great pride in the program that, are, that myself and my colleagues designed together, uh, a big, big appeal was that we also offered the world's first education guarantee. We were coming into a market where an MBA could be yours for $5,200 over two years. We were coming to market with a product that was about $40,000 over one year. Okay. So we're, we're charging a $35,000 premium. Right. And you'd say, well, why would you ever pay that? Well, the presumption was that you were gonna get a job that paid enough money that you could repay that. And so uh, we came up, technically it was a contingency loan program. The way it worked was you didn't start to repay your loan on the $40,000 until you got a job paying at least, I think at that time it was $50,000. So until then we would carry it. Now that wasn't a big risk for us. We just took out an insurance policy and played the actuarial tables and folded the cost of the insurance policy into the price of the degree. Right. Okay. Um, and then we presented it though as this educational guarantee. We believe in this so strongly that we'll guarantee you that. And armed with that guarantee, we were able to go before what was then a new democratic party uh, running the province of Ontario. We needed their agreement. And we were able to show them that we could actually save people money by charging them $35,000 uh -huh. and getting it down to one year. Right. Suddenly now the press is really interested. Why should I care? But can I need to, that's, but I now, need to guide you back to the, the uh, initial question though. Okay. Keep going. Well, so year two, we need, yeah. Year two, we switch gears. Ah. Year two, they've heard about the educational reward, uh, guarantee and everything else. So now we're going to talk about the people in the class. Right. Now we do the tour of Canada, and in every city, we identify a handful of our students who took the leap, who joined this LinkedIn innovative program. LinkedIn before there was LinkedIn. The whole nine yards. <laughs> so, and, the, and the press would run the story on the local hero. And, okay, so it was your power of personality 
media interviews and the network. And some, some- And a great offer, a well, great proposition. It's a great proposition. And of course, we also benefited from the controversy uh, of charging people full fee. Right. And now we were economically elite and so on. And so probably half of those interviews were me on the defense uh, <laughs> right. as people attacked us for becoming economically elite and so on. Right. But then explain that gave me the chance to, to tell the whole story. Okay, right. but then now Dan wants to know what you would do today. What's the what's the MBA we need today? Oh, the MBA today. And how much does it cost? Yikes. So, uh, well, first of all, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the nice part of your intro is you, you, you <laughs> didn't mention, you said first operating without government subsidy, you didn't say uh, this is the guy responsible for your student loans. <laughs> um, we're seeing in, 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 uh, in, in graduate business programs, even more fragmentation. So there used to be just an MBA for science and technology. Now we get an MBA for science uh, for MBA. We've got an AMBA for people who will have a commerce degree and want to come back. That's one year. We got an executive MBA for people who have been out of school for an extended period, can't leave their jobs, want to join part time. We got the Queen's Cornell MBA for people who want to practice business on either side of the board. And since an MBA is principally about working with companies and running companies, for those who have more of a, a, a technical focus, We've got a master's of finance. We got a master's of sustainable finance. We got a master's of analytics. We got a master's of entrepreneurial studies. We'll give you a master's in anything you want. The key though is that in each of these cases, the demands of these sectors have become so expansive. You just can't cover it all in an MBA program. Right. You really do have to, to focus. So I would take that focus, as far as how I would promote it, it'd be the same way, just different media. We didn't have social media back then, for example. Right, okay, thanks for that. I'm gonna go to the internet now. We've got lots of questions coming in from our online audience. So um, an ethics question for you, Ken. What is your view regarding the ethics of AI and markers constantly trying to predict behavior and or, I'm gonna add, using all of your data? that they grab off your loyalty programs. Sure. Um, AI is kind of like nuclear power. You know, it really does depend how you want to use it. Uh, I mean, as, as a teacher, um, I live in fear of AI. I, I, I imagine, you. well, imagine assigning an essay question to your class. Right, what do they do? They, they turn to their chat GPA and, and they type in their thing and it pops an essay. Um, Next student doesn't want to plagiarize or duplicate, so they ask the question a slightly different way and they get a slightly different answer and, and so on. Um, so that's AI used to its worst. AI used to its best can be phenomenal. It, it's like the ultimate concierge. You know, yeah, I, I, I connect with you, you find out about me, you know my profile, you have a whole bunch of data stored upon me, you can make predictions about what I like and don't like. Now, all of a sudden, uh, you're being more efficient. And I like it because I'm getting uh, a, a better experience, offers that are tailored uh, just to me, for example. Because we can deal with more precision, we can now make financial estimates, we can now get into the ROI. Now the CFO talks to us instead of you know, uh, humoring us. Uh, well, CFOs. What are the ethics? I mean, yeah, we're seeing there's benefits, but are we in an ethically sound place as, as marketing? Well, it's just, marketing mind? It, it is just like nuclear, nuclear, nuclear weapons or nuclear power. It depends on the user and how they want to use it. Right. The, the, the technology doesn't know uh, an ethics or morality, and you can't expect the technology to, to do so. It is the user who has the responsibility for how they want to use that technology. And, and frankly, it's the user who decides for themselves what they consider ethical. You know, uh, uh, so if I give Loblaws my PC Optimum card, bink, that's all it takes. They know all sorts of things about me. I, I've agreed to that. Mm -hmm. So, and they're using my data and we're all sound, everything's cool. As long as you're getting offers that are meaningful to you. Now, right. if they're selling your data to other people, right. um, if they're disclosing that this is Meredith's data, right. that's, that's not appropriate. Okay. 
Okay. But the research is, is fairly clear. And in fact, it's a commerce grad. Uh, you think about Brian Pearson, the founder of, of uh, Loyalty One Air Miles, or one of the founders. You know, Brian will be the first to say his research is unequivocal. Consumers don't mind giving you information if you're giving them something back in return that okay. is valued to them. Okay. If you're not, now you're now you're you're really misusing that intimacy. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Do we have another question? Yeah, we do have a question at the back of the room. Hi, Ken Ediho, uh, Commerce 08. Uh, two questions for you. One, uh, your thoughts on marketing for not-for-profits uh, and charitable organizations in today's environment, um, from donations to fundraising, what activities you need to change, you know, whether they're going door-to-door -door or, or any other activities they're engaged in. So that's the first question. And the, the second question, um, your thoughts on the airline industry today in the Canadian market with you know, all these new ultra low cost carriers coming in, the dynamics of WestJet, Air Canada and so forth. Okay, um, why? <laughs> uh, well, let's start with nonprofits, okay? Uh, I think there was a time when everybody believed that nonprofits could, could do marketing basically the same way that everybody else does marketing. Uh, I think we've now come to realize that that's really not the case. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Um, if I'm selling pens, uh, I can identify who my competition is. It's another pen company. And I can probably figure out the basis of our competition. Uh, how does it feel? You know, how thick is the line? How long does the ink size? It, it's very simple. When I'm a nonprofit, I'm competing for somebody's discretionary income. I'm competing against what they want to spend on their recreation. I'm competing against what they want to spend on groceries and, and so on. And so if you think your, your consumer is in a period of economic pinch, the market just isn't as big for nonprofits. Even though the need may be greater, there's no greater need than food banks, for example, these days, but they're having money trouble raising money. Why donor fatigue? Everybody's coming to us for money. And as a consequence, we have to make a decision about which causes we want to support. And which causes do I want to support? I want to support the ones that are most likely to affect me. So um, easy to raise money for breast cancer, easy to raise money for prostate cancer, easy to raise money for heart disease, easy to raise money for diabetes. Right? How about irritable bowel syndrome? Devastating disease, life or death consequences. I mean, all the, all the, 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 the characteristics that would make it a great cause, but it doesn't affect us. And as a consequence, my money's going to go elsewhere. And you know, and as a charity, I can't say, give to me. I'm more worthy than that charity. We don't have that power of, of, of persuasion. And so the real challenge now is to, is to establish for, the, for that donor, if you're going for a donor, what's in it for you, right? You know, at, at Queens, we, we used to play the game of um, support, your, uh, support your, your alma mater. You know, it's, it's the right thing to do and blah, 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 right? What do we do now? We hold events like this. We give you access to Smith Connects. We're trying to give you a reason to get behind us because the ongoing support, the after sales service is gonna be there. Um, and so we've had to change the nature of our, of our pitches. We've had to change how we think about the competition. And of course, we can't keep going back to the same people over and over again. And that's why you start to see now you know, we all want the heavy hitter, of course, the Stephen Smiths of this world, you know, who are going to write a big check and let us build a building and everything else. But the reality is we're really looking for the, the 10, 15, $20 donations, enough of those to, to, to make a big difference. Um, so, so that's the big challenge, I think, with, with nonprofit marketing. We get to part two, airports, airplanes, airlines. Um, yeah, again, uh, it depends who you're selling to. You know, um, when I travel, I, I, I'm, I'm typically traveling to, to give a talk somewhere or, or hold a seminar somewhere. So I, I've got uh, my travel clothes. I've got some leisure clothes. I, I've probably got a suit or, or two packed in there. 
I got a bunch of presentation equipment, uh, you know, my remote control, my laptop. I got a lot of bags, right? Um, and, and, you know, I may be traveling to Vancouver. It's a five hour flight. It's a, it's a long flight. Um, and when you live in Kingston, it's even longer because it's three hours to the airport and then five hours to work to Vancouver. I just don't want to hassle, you know, just give me a price, give me all my service and away we go. And, and in fact, in my case, because it often gets, hope there's no clients in the room because these expenses are getting passed on to the client, I'm a little less <laughs> price sensitive. <laughs> now, what if I'm traveling alone? Uh, well, now, you know, if I'm going down south, you know, what, what do I really need? Uh, shorts, bathing suit, uh, one pair of jeans that I'll wear over and over again. You know, uh, maybe it's a VRBO with a laundry. I can do laundry down there. Um, I really don't want to pay for multiple bags. I don't want that folded in. I'd rather pay 25 bucks a bag because I'm only going to have one. I know what it is. Um, depending on why you fly, and what your preference is, you may like everything unbundled, but there are going to be others who want it all folded in to one price. We're even seeing this with uh, tipping practice today. You know, the old practice was here's your bill, and then you decide how much to give. We suggest 15%, but you know, you can give more or, or give less as appropriate. Now, here in Toronto, there are a couple of restaurants that don't allow tipping, it's already included in the price. And for some people, that's, they, they like that better. They like it better than being forced to play 15%. Even though it comes out to the same amount, they like, they, they, they like the fact that it's all inclusive. So when you think about these airlines, if you want low price, remember, you get what you pay for, right? They're gonna charge you the basic flight to get you from point A to point B. You want more than that, you're gonna have to pay for it, right? And if you don't like that idea, then you're going to have to buy the all-inclusive package, which comes with all of those services already priced in. And it's really up to you and, and what your situation dictates you require. All right, I'm going to ask one more question that's come to us from the internet. I am mindful of the time. So last, I think this is a great question for us to finish on, at least for the online audience. If you have the superpower to change one thing in the marketing world, what would it be? Wow. <laughs> um, you know, when, when we think of marketing, I think we often discriminate between marketing the art, the creative side, marketing the science, the strategy side. Yeah. There's a third characteristic, it's called discipline. When I think of campaigns that fail, they don't usually fail because somebody writes bad copy. They don't usually fail because somebody comes up with a bad plan. They fail because we lose sight of who our consumer is. Right. You know, in the interest of growing, we try and service two different segments with the same product, formula for disaster, right? Look at Eaton's, right? When Eaton's went, uh, Eaton's used to be a quality, quality department store, then they added this bargain basement. Well, bargain basement, you couldn't find any service help. Right? So what did you do when you needed service? You went upstairs and you approached the Eaton staff. The Eaton staff said, sorry, not my department, can't help you out. Well, that's frustrating for a consumer. And if the, if the, uh, and if the, the service person upstairs decided to help you out, well, now you were getting bargain basement prices, but not paying the cost of that service. So in effect, the high-end customer was subsidizing the low-end customer, and that's a formula for disaster, right? Because right? now I'm charging you for something, I'm not giving you any value in, in return. So that, that's a loss of, of, of the discipline of sticking with your customer. Discipline also comes in to staying on top of your customer and how they're changing over time, right? Um, take Tim Hortons, roll up the rim, right? This, this is a, a, a legacy campaign, uh, a world beater campaign by, by any standard. You know, people were, people were buying tools to, to cut the rim, to make it easy to roll up the rim. That, that's how ubiquitous it, it became. But when the world went to apps, suddenly roll up the rim lost, lost some of its glamor, right? They, they really didn't stay on top of how their consumer was changing with the times. 
And so in sticking with the tried and true, but not, not modifying it to accommodate changes in consumer behavior and taste, what you got was this uncoupling. Marketing is more than anything else a discipline. And in these times when financial concerns have such a huge impact on what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do as marketers, remember that margin management issue, right? Um, in, in, in times like that, it gets very hard, very easy at times to, to, to move away from what made us great. And I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, uh, I teach a course uh, uh, to our MBAs with, with David Kincaid. And, and David, uh, as you may know, amongst his many achievements, he was once the, uh, the CMO at Labatt's. And uh, Labatt's had just uh, taken ownership of a beer called the uh, Kokanee beer, uh, made with the glacier water of, of BC and, and pure and, and, and all those good things. And Kokanee took off. 5% market share, and I think it's his first year of operation. And in the beer market, that 5% is a huge, huge market share. So uh, David goes and he approaches his executive committee and, and says, you know, I, I need more capacity. We got to expand our plant in, in the Coconies. Well, the, the COO at the time said, well, why would you do that? You know, we have a plant in Windsor sitting half empty. Why don't we just manufacture the, the, the product in, in, in Windsor? And David says, no, I can't do that, blah, blah, blah. But he loses the game of numbers, right? So they start manufacturing in Windsor. The next day, Molson comes out with an ad. Where are the glaciers in, in the Lake Ontario? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and all of a sudden, the, the whole campaign was lost. Wow. You know? it, so what's your superpower? What's the thing you're changing? with your massive marketing superpowers. With my massive marketing superpowers? Yeah, I also need to let our online audience go, so. What, what am I? So, so to sorry. the question was, if you had any uh, marketing superpower uh, to change something in the marketing world, what would it be? More heart. More heart. Yeah. Can you give us two yeah. short lines about that, but no more because I got to let the sure. online. <laughs> it's like being in class running overtime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so Tony Chapman says, you know, it's, it's all about head, heart, and hands, right? Yeah. Win their head, win their heart, so you'll, you'll win their hands. You think about analytics and AI, we got the head covered. Yeah. Right? You think about social media, you think about all the new technologies for reaching customers, we got the hands covered. Everybody knows what to say. Everybody knows where to say it. There's no differentiation there. No. It's what you say. It's the heart. And do you think the heart is missing are we seeing not enough heart i think uh, uh i think again where the heart comes in conflict is with the financial performance i can demonstrate to you the value of changing the product this way i can demonstrate to you the value of this media over that media trying to convince you that one ad has more heart than another is a much more difficult campaign and so uh, my, my wife is a, is a former uh, COO, Six Sigma type. Right? And, and we used to joke that, uh, you know, how do you make your living? I'm a marketer. It's, it, it's all gab, it's all, all flash and, and so on. Very hard to substantiate that. But trying to find a way to really understand what, what is driving that consumer's behavior. And, and we know, it, it, we wish it was head, we wish it was logical, I could deal with that. But more often than not, it, it lies in the heart. It, it lies in how they feel about, about things. Okay, that's great. Ken, thank you so much. It's been really a great pleasure to speak with you today. I do have to wrap things up, at least for our online audience. Uh, we did promise them an hour and we've gone over by a couple of minutes. Sure. So thank you to everyone who's here in person. Thank you to the, to the audience who is watching online. I do want to re remind everybody who's here physically and uh, online that there are lots of webinars coming up. So stay tuned to your Smith Business Insights uh, newsletter. If you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you should do that. Um, smithqueens.com slash insight. Write that down and sign up for the newsletter if you haven't, uh, so you don't miss anything. Ken, congratulations. Uh, it's been a remarkable career. These people are all here for you. Um, and I, I think we'll let our on, well, uh, in-person audience, we can stay and mingle. Online audience, we bid you farewell and we thank you for your attendance. We don't Online, know. if you've got... <laughs>